he escaped unscathed. After this, um, the 1880s and 1890s sees a sort of slow decline. And his last recorded appearance, and this is sort of contested, as people always try and push it further and further into the 20th century, is generally taken to be in 1904, in Everton. Um, and so he is the kind of ideal Victorian legend. He pops up in the popular imagination the year that Victoria came to the throne, and he dies just three years after she did. So it's a, he, you know, he's a loyal Victorian in terms of he doesn't have state his welcome. Or does he? You know, we'll, we'll look into that later. Um, and if I can, there we are. So this is what I'm going to um, look at. Firstly, before we get into any of this, I need to uh, an admission that I will not be revealing who Springfield Jack is. There's a very good reason for this, and that's I don't know. Um, the other reason is, as a cultural historian, my interest isn't really in that. My interest isn't in um, sort of revealing or speculating about the individual identity. That's kind of that Fortean Times type thing, you know, sort of Loch Ness Monster crowd. So I'm less interested in that. Um, if you want to find out about that, then I would point you in the direction of Mike Dash's work, which is um, it's on the internet, it's on his website, and it's a very good analysis of, of, uh, sort of stripping back this legend to the bare bones. Personally, what I'm more interested in is this kind of mercurial, migratory legend that operates across different popular cultures in the Victorian period. And so the first thing I'll do is have a look at the perform a cultural autopsy on Springfield Jack. If we could actually hold him down and cut him open, what kind of popular cultural influences would we have found sort of beating within him? Secondly, after I've done that, I'd like to move on to looking at the way his, uh, he was perceived, his representations were sort of differed in, in urban and rural environments and between oral and literary portrayals, because there's constant shifting. He's, he's not a fixed character. As befits his pranks to nature, Spring Hill Jack's repeated movement back and forth between the urban and rural, between the oral and literary, um, messes up all those boundaries, those nice, neat cultural boundaries. And you know, it, it's very much in his nature to do that. But it's an interesting way of exploring the diversity of Victorian popular cultures. And then finally, as this shows there, I will be looking at this sort of kind of decline, why this legend faded out or changed so that it no longer had the power that it once held in people's minds. So, uh, as an early depiction, we start with the cultural anatomy of Springfield Jack. He had a very protracted birth, and he didn't arrive fully formed. Um, it, it, there was a kind of a transforming, uh, acquisitive nature to his legend, which is a polite way of saying it was pretty much made up as it went along. He starts as a fairly standard rural ghost. You know, there was nothing unusual about um, people in rural environments seeing ghosts which were animals, even white animals, you know. Um, so the, the thing with this, the interesting thing with this, is how he changed from that and became an individual. And I would say the thing that really drives this is the press reports of 1838. Amidst wildly conflicting uh, sort of ideas and descriptions of Springfield Jack, he gradually emerged from a number of, sort of cultural tropes and traditions from, I will suggest, folkloric motifs, sort of traditional ones, contemporary proper entertainments were, uh, perhaps informed it, and then there's also grimmer urban realities, things like rape narratives, all helped inform um, accounts of Springfield or Jack. As is often the case with cultural history, it's, it's a lot easier to identify these things and to explain direct links um, and correlations between them. But what I will do is kind of suggest a variety of factors which sort of overlap, creating a sense of, of substance and depth from which something original was spawned from pre-existing influences. So if we start with the folkloric tropes, um, in his initial in, in sort of incarnation as a supernatural fiend, he did play to very sort of long-established folkloric tropes. The mischievous an often sort of malevolent puck figure of, of uh, fairy lore. The ability of witches and imps to transform back and forth between human and, and animal or demonic form. And indeed, there's even something of the, sort of the hybrid animal monster depictions of the horned and hooved devil about him. And sometimes this is made very explicit. 
And you, you know, you've got touches of this um, <clears throat> there with the, the sort of the big floppy claws and sort of very animalistic in a way. The sort of classic devil's tail. So his frightening, his frightening appearance, his, his talons, his fire breathing, the inhuman uh, leaping, all helped generate a sense that this was something supernatural. It wasn't just a freak of nature. And it, it kind of suggests the, the persistent strength of these diabolical signifiers in the popular Victorian imagination. They still had currency at the start of the Victorian period. At the same time as trickster nature, chimed very closely with popular portrayals of the devil in both oral folklore and in street ballads. Um, sometimes, you know, he was the butt of, of uh, tricks, but frequently there was always this element to deceive and play, play jokes on people in a sort of watered-down way. Of course, if we believe that the 1838 uh, events were all to do with um, a prank, then obviously these things were probably consciously done to provoke a sense of there's a devil walking the streets of London. Perceived as a ghost, which is another sort of aspect of his legend, several accounts suggest Springhill Jack's origins lay with his associations with haunted or at least sort of morally tainted spaces. His first appearance near Barnes Common automatically linked to a place, according to Elliot O'Donnell, who um, kind of commented on this, that Barnes Common was notorious for numerous robberies and assaults that frequently took place there, but also for the, a large number of suicides. And so there was something about that space which kind of gave birth to this ghost. Uh, Elizabeth Villiers, um, who's another person who, who kind of made a passing comment on, on Spring Hill Jack, she made the mistaken claim that his first appearance had actually been in Cutthroat Lane in, in Clapham Common. But again, there was associations with that. Uh, place called Cutthroat Lane is obviously going to have some associations with it. Um, and Villiers says that this, this particular lane was looked upon with superstitious fear by all who lived nearby, and they thought that Spring Hill Jack was a haunted spirit uh, born of that evil place, because he never seemed to go far from there, which is wrong, but they, you know, these were the associations. The thing is, he wasn't a traditional sort of ghost. He's never a traditional anything. He's not a straightforward uh, sort of continuation of, of one thing. The Illustrated Police News in 1881 uh, described Spring Hill Jack as the most vulgar and unromantic ghost imaginable, <laughs> lamenting that modern ghosts don't act in the tradition of their, uh, their species because they, didn't, they, they had no moral resolve. They didn't bring criminals to justice. They didn't point the way to any guilt-hidden uh, treasure. All right, so the, the kind of moral role that they'd had in the perhaps medieval and early modern period was non-existent. In 1882, the Daily News declared, um, compared with the fine old well-established ghosts, such as the Headless Cavalier, Spring Hill Jack was a mere vulgar ruffian fond of horseplay. <laughs> so he was a, a different breed, a sort of slightly degenerate ghost, I suppose. So there's those kind of folkloric tropes. When he moved into the metropolis, he also became part of a pre-existing tradition of metropolitan hellraisers and even monsters. This kind of went back to at least the early 18th century with the uh, Mohawks, which had been a vicious gang of aristocratic thugs who are renowned for uh, sticking fish hooks in men's faces and sexually assaulting women. And there is, you know, resonances with, with Spring Hill Jack there. More immediately, perhaps a more obvious predecessor was the London Monster, who appeared in 1788. And everyone goes, oh, that's 100 years for Jack the Ripper and that sort of stuff. But it, it is amazing because Jack, uh, Spring Hill Jack emerged 50 years on from this, so you know, every 50 years he seemed to get someone who's not too nice. Um, I haven't done the mass, but I'm not sure when the next one is due. But the London Monster um, demonstrated a very similar sort of uh, modus operandi, if you like, to the Spring Hill Jack of early 1838. He pursued and attacked women. Um, I've seen in most images he's, he's just a normal person. For some reason here he's got chicken legs. But... Um, he is chasing after people with this sort of sharpened prong. And um, just as there was supposed to be a gang of Spring Hill Jacks, or assumed to be a gang of Spring Hill Jacks, after the, the culprit, uh, Renwick Williams, was put on trial in, in the early 1790s for these attacks, the, the attacks continued, and people thought that there'd been a, there was a group of kind of 
men monsters um, continuing his work. So there, there is very much these sort of parallels between him and Spring Hill Jack, but Spring Hill Jack is far more of a, a supernatural edge to him than this kind of strange pervert. Um, there's also literary traditions, most obviously in his name, the, the, the name Jack. Jack was traditionally the expression of the everyman hero. Um, he was also the name of the, the wily trickster in printed literature and ballads and folk tales, and, and Spring Hill Jack fits very much into that. Jack is also an extremely popular name from chapbook fiction protagonists in this period, and several commentators noted how Spring Hill Jack's leaping had caused them to confuse him with the owner of the Seven League Boots. That his tales had credibility in the minds of fearful children because Jack the Giant Killer um, and the Seven League Boots were things that they took as history in, in their imagination. So the application of this name kind of tapped into a, very much a rich and popular vein of daring escapades in classic chapbook tales. And what Spring Hill Jack seemed to be doing was relocating those fantastical narratives into a modern urban setting. Perhaps just as important, though, was um, melodrama <coughs> and the sort of theatrical influences. And Spring Hill Jack is incredibly theatrical in, in his whole kind of manner and disguise and even this kind of Errol Flynn-like laughing that he keeps doing before he springs off eventually. As a mode of entertainment, um, melodrama had its, its origins in unlicensed theatres of the period and found expression in sort of cheaper booth theatres too. And these sort of plebeian theatres were frequently uh, known for shortening melodramas, cutting out all the boring bits, and just keeping, uh, and this is a quote, ghosts, murders, combats, and thrills. So you just kind of cut it down to the good stuff, and that's more or less what you get with Springfield Jack. The stage villain in melodrama was often a threatening and powerful figure, and it can to Spring Hill Jack echo the heightened narratives of gothic melodrama, spilling out beyond the stage and into the streets. Melodrama has sort of been viewed as a, very, as a fictional way of simplifying urban life um, through employing sort of identifiable signifiers, the same as the cowboy hat in, in, in westerns. Um, in the early Victorian period, the villain was color-coded. He, he, he was dressed in black. Um, and it was a shorthand for villainy. And in his 1883 um, account, Childhood Memories of Gothic Melodrama, H. Barton Baker recalled how the villain had often had his face uh, sort of blacked up with burnt cork and was strangely costumed with bluff boots and deep gauntlets. And more than one account of Spring Hill Jack refers to a dark cloaked figure wearing gauntlets or something like this. It's, it's kind of, again, resonances rather than direct links. Furthermore, um, melodrama had grown from an anti-aristocratic sort of popular radicalism. And so it was fond of casting the villain as an aristocrat. There's a, there's a class issue to this. And of course, once um, these rumors start to go around that this was a prank by aristocrats as young men, um, it started to really um, sort of make those links with, with melodrama, if you like. The idea of the callous rape preying on women went back to at least the 17th century. But it's perhaps promoted less by realities than by uh, late 18th century Gothic novels and particularly less sort of plagiarized chapbook versions where the aristocrat was this kind of um, demented villain. In the 1830s, illegal radical newspapers tended to feed the stereotype to illustrate aristocratic decadence. And it's, so it's not surprising that eventually the press comes to blame this man. Henry de la Pere Beresford, the third Marcus of Waterford, claimed that he was most likely the person to um, be behind the Jack, Spring Hill Jack scare of early 1838. Unfortunately, they didn't have any evidence. Um, and it has been argued that neither did Peter Haining when he wrote his book in 1977 about this, and he more or less fabricated the evidence to prove the point. Um, it seems to be based on, and they didn't always name him, um, but they, they kind of alluded to it. It's based on a bad reputation of a young man, young aristocratic Hellraiser, who's renowned for vandalism, uh, for violence, and at Melton Mowbray in, in the year before, in 1837, an overt disregard for the forces of the law that he tried breaking one of his associates out of jail, and he'd even painted several buildings in the town red, and that's where you get the phrase paint the town red from. It's this man. Um, so, I mean, I'm not going to spend too long saying it was him. 
right? But um, that, that's, it was a kind of a view in the press that he may well be to blame. Finally, um, in terms of this kind of autopsy as such, we got him to Jack the criminal. When he's been remembered at all, it's as, normally it's as kind of a curious footnote in, in 19th century uh, criminal history. And there are two aspects of, of crime that uh, kind of meet in this legend, the highwayman and the sex attacker. Highwaymen had, of course, had virtually vanished from the roads around London by 1815. There was a, a late incident in early 1831. And they're, by the 1830s, they're undergoing a sort of a transformation in literature into the romantic hero. They were being detached from historical reality. You had Edward Lighty uh, Bugos, uh, Paul Clifford, and William Harris Mainsworth's 1834 Gothic romance Rookwood, very much based on Dick Turpin. They made them these nostalgic figures of romantic fantasy. And from certainly from the 1830s to 1850s, the, the initial period when this whole Springer Jack thing was running, there, there's everywhere you sort of went, there were these kind of daring exploits of Dick Turpin. You know, they're in the Newgate calendar, they're in ballads, they're in chapbooks, they're in serialized novels. It was a very popular trend at this time. And it has been argued that obviously this popular crime literature all added to the context of, sort of an exaggerated sense of threat from criminals in an urban environment at this time. So it kind of feeds, feeds itself in a way. But also, the criminals undergoing this kind of um, reinvention as somehow heroic, an individual who's not conforming to the demands of modern society. You know, he's that sort of like random speck of chaos in the city, which is exactly what Spring Hill Jack is too. And obviously when there's accounts of Spring Hill Jack jumping over and uh, attacking mail coaches, then obviously it just kind of helps solidify the view that this is a highwayman, but a new type of 19th century highwayman. There's also a certain type of slightly sort of muted admiration for Spring Hill Jack in that um, he made fools of the police who couldn't catch him. Um, and this kind of resonated with a protracted struggle for the Metropolitan Police that had only been around sort of nine years prior to Spring Hill Jack making an appearance in London, um, trying to establish itself in Victorian England. And Spring Hill Jack could sort of still do what many others just sort of vicariously imagined doing, which was sort of beating up policemen and, and leaping away again. The other aspect of this, um, and this is very much informed by when, when female victims gave their accounts, is that they tended to conform to rape narratives. Now this doesn't mean that Jack, uh, Spring Hill Jack was a rapist, there's nothing to necessarily um, sort of say that he, he was. But the point is that um, the way the stories were recounted of these encounters followed very much that narrative pattern. In the decade preceding uh, Jack's appearance, the press, particularly people at the Times, had given considerable space to criminal uh, court reporting. And they had referred to assaults as too disgusting to relate, kind of making rape all the more frightening. Women were obviously reluctant to uh, come to court because frequently their virtue was um, on trial as much as the rapist. And Anne Clark has suggested that when women wrote their own accounts of sexual assault, they almost invariably ad uh, adopted a tone of melodramatic romance. Uh, of innocent maidens who always faint when ravished, and therefore, if you're unconscious, then you don't have to describe a confusing and painful experience. And you get the same thing, more or less being reiterated um, in accounts of Spring Hill Jack. The women's immediate reaction is to, is to faint, to drop to the floor, that type of thing. Sort of. When Mary Stevens was supposedly attacked by Spring Hill Jack near Clapham Common in 1838, she described how a tall figure leapt to her side, and in her terror, she would have sunk to the ground with strong arms caught her and held her prisoner. He kissed her, gave a loud laugh, then released her, leaping away into the night. People dismissed her account as the elaborations of a hysterical woman, but it helped protect her virtue. The reference to being held in strong arms sent, uh, gave the impression that she'd been overpowered, that she wasn't a willing party to this. What, um, you know, the point is that what they were doing is this kind of fainting, overpowering elements were always brought to the fore in accounts by victims. His reputation, in terms of, of sort of being a, some type of sex attacker, um, wasn't aided by imitators who followed him and who may well have donned disguise to actually um, conduct sort of sexual assaults on women. 
In April 1841, Springheel Jack, or somebody pretending to be Springheel Jack, supposed to have returned to London and was terrorizing the King's Road in Camden. He is described as, quote, a tall brute enveloped in a large blue cloak with glasses of dark color over his eyes, which gave him the most awful appearance. He was said to assault his female victims in the most shameful and indelicate manner, taking indecent liberties with them, which, you know, given the sort of, um, the, the way in which these things would be expressed in the press, that's perhaps a, a fairly strong indication that um, there may well have been sexual assault there. In an 1847 case, uh, another imitator dressed up in a, a skin coat that looked like a bullock's hide, and he, he wore a skull cap and horns and a mask, and again, roughly handled and assaulted a female domestic servant in Devonshire. Here at least, this suspect um, is a man called Captain Finch. He was a retired 60-year-old army officer he was supposed to be more or less on his deathbed, he had given him Iran. Um, he was tried and found guilty of that assault. So they, they caught that imitator at least. So these are some of the, sort of the traditional and contemporary influences that we can see in the formulation of Springfield Jack. What I want to now look at and move on to is um, the way he moves between different cultural localities and different sort of cult forms of, of cultural transformation. Portrayals and reactions of spring Hill Jack were influenced very much by the environment in which he existed or appeared. In rural Vance in autumn 1837, the suburban ghost, which has been his original name, not too kind of catchy, um, he was first a phantasmal animal, which kind of suited a rural environment. Yet London couldn't easily accommodate a white bull walking or stalking the streets. It didn't really fit in. And so what you get as, as Jack moves closer to the metropolis is he sort of takes on anthropomorphic form. He becomes man-shaped, even if he's still got horns and, and claws. He is roughly man-shaped. When he appeared at Hampton Court, he was described as an unearthly warrior, clad in armor of polished brass, which comes a long way from a bull, um, wearing spring shoes and with large claw gloves. And this image became fixed for a time. Residents of Twickenham and Hounslow encountered the ghost attired in polished steel armor with red shoes. The reason why I've left him on there so long is because this painting was done in 1840, and it almost seems, you know, this isn't the standard sort of dress of 1840. Um, it almost makes you wonder if he was kind of being kind of provocative by these accounts of uh, a ghost clad in armor, and there he is, he gets his portrait done in full plate mail. Um, the solidity, as I said, of things that helped him become an individual rather than just some other, any other ghost, was the name. And this really ties his legend together. And as I will suggest later on, it's, it's part of the reason why it eventually starts to sort of dissolve as well. And it seems to come around very quickly. I've, I've kind of looked very closely at, at what, he, what he's being called in the, in the accounts that we have. In, on the 14th of January, 1838, he's still being referred to as the ghost. By the 20th, he's being referred to as Spring Hill Jack. So somewhere within those six days, that name seems to have popped up and stuck somehow. Um, his appearance changes again in what has become the classic uh, attack. Any of you who sort of um, know anything about this Spring Hill Jack legend is probably sort of waiting for some mention of, of Jane Alsop. So this is Jane Alsop bit. Um, Unlike all the kind of miasma of rumor and speculation that swept through the capitals, the fact that the Allsops, who were a sort of prosperous middle-class uh, family, they were willing to risk uh, derision by coming before the magistrates to give their testimony as to what happened in this attack. And this is a time when people like the Times were still promoting stories of this ghost as the sort of the ridiculous things that servant girls would believe. So there was that kind of, you wouldn't do it really, unless you, there was something behind this. This is the account, I want to sort of give it a little bit of detail because it's, it's an interesting one. It is perhaps the most fleshed out example of an encounter <coughs> with Spring Hill Jack that we have. The Alsops lived in Beerbinder Lane, which is a remote road between the, the villages of Bow and Old Fort. And giving evidence at the Lambeth Street Police Office, 18-year-old uh, Jane recounted how about quarter to nine on the 20th of February, in the evening, there was a violent ringing of the bell in the front of the house, and she went to see who the caller was, what they wanted, why, why it was so urgent. The man said he was a policeman, and he said, supposedly, for God's sake, bring a light. 
was just caught spring heel jack in the lane. So Jane immediately goes running off, fetches the candle, brings it back. When she gives it to him, he immediately threw off his outer garment, which had been this big cloak. He applied the lighted candle to his breast, this is her description, and presented the most hideous and frightful appearance, vomiting forth a quantity of blue and white flame from his mouth. In the hasty glance that she saw, his eyes resembled red balls of fire, that he wore a large helmet, and his dress, which appeared to fit him very tightly, appeared to her to resemble white oil skin. He lunged at her, grabbed her dress and neck, and commenced tearing her gown with his claws, which he was certain were made of some metallic substance. She managed to slip away and got to the house, but he came after her and caught up with her again on the steps, where he again tore her neck and arms with his claws and ripped out a clump of her hair. After a considerable struggle, Jane was, was pulled inside the house by her older sister. Her younger sister had also been there, but she was rather too petrified to do anything. Um, and they managed to slam the door shut, shut Spring Hill Jack outside. And yet the persistent brother still kept knocking and harassing the household until the daughters went upstairs and started shouting for help from the upstairs windows, in which case he finally went. Um, Jane's dress was, was pretty much torn from her, and she's described herself as suffering all night from the shock she had sustained. And this is often the thing. It wasn't so much the physical attack, it was the shock of, of being attacked by Springfield Jack that really um, got to people. She said that she had spent uh, she had spent the night in considerable pain because of wounds from her arm to her arm, neck and shoulders, which she said probably came from his claws or fangs. Um, so it was quite clear that, that she had been very distressed. Um, but she saw this as some kind of animal type creature. Many of these elements were evident in a second attack, which is slightly less familiar, but for those who sort of know anything about the legend, um, you've probably heard of again, which is of Lucy Scales, another 18-year-old girl. And this happened just a week later, on the 28th of February. Um, this time he popped up in Limehouse. So he's still in the, sort of the, the London region. She'd been walking down the street, having left her brothers. Uh, she was with her younger sister. She was slightly ahead of her sister. And she saw a man in a side alley. And first she thought it was a woman, because uh, the person had what she thought was a bonnet on. But as she approached, he stepped out of the alley and just uh, blew a quantity of flame in her face, like fireball. She instantly dropped to the ground and was seized by violent fits, which lasted several hours after the attack. Um, she later said that she saw very quickly before she sort of fell over that he was a tall, thin man. And her younger sister said the same thing. He was a tall, thin man, and she said that he had a, a gentlemanly appearance, whatever that means. Um, the, the younger sister, who didn't actually appear in court, which was unfortunate, kind of a testimony was given by her brother, said that he'd been wrapped in a large cloak and that he had a small lamp sort of attached to his chest. So as she approached, um, it could be that he lit this flame and there was uh, help create the fireball, suggesting there was, it wasn't supernatural, you know, there was sort of something going on behind the curtain, if you like. Um, initially dazzled by the fireball, Lucy's sister went to um, her older sister's aid and Spring Hill Jack, in a rather undramatic way, just wandered off. Uh, so th there's one that's this kind of very dramatic incident, and that's perhaps why the police pick up on it, also because it happened perhaps to a middle-class girl. This one, there were uh, sort of more working-class girls um, out of the streets at night, which always had these kind of connotations that you must be a prostitute if you're out in the streets of London after dark. Um, and also, it didn't have those kind of dramatic narrative qualities to it that the former narrative. Spring Hill Jack transformed again, though, when he left uh, London. Victims in the capital have made very much uh, a lot of, of vicious claws and fire breathing. All of this disappears. There, I've only come across two other accounts where um, there, there are claws involved and no fire breathing. There's another fire breathing incident back in London again later on. The tight fitting oil skin thing also goes. Um, in, back in a predominantly rural environment, he is often seen as being clad in animal hides. As early as April 1838, the Brighton Gazette claimed that he found his way to the Sussex coast and he'd returned to the shape of a bear or some other four-footed uh, animal. And so away from the confines of the city, he could kind of surrender that human form, the anthropomorphic shape, and become more bestial. And 
uh, although it's a later account and this isn't a kind of like photograph or anything, you know, this could be completely fabricated given that it was from the Austrian police news. Um, there he is on the arch uh, with a tail and, and sort of general fluffiness would suggest he's some sort of animal and they're shooting as he again ran up across the rooftops um, of um, Newport in Lincolnshire, apparently. It could well have been that they realised they're putting Springhill Jack on the front cover of the sort of newspaper or something. So. A bit very cynical as it is for him. Um, in London in 1838, he'd been highly mobile. He'd been all over the place, to the point where it was suspected he was, or these pranksters were using the early train lines to move around. Um, but when he appeared in other cities, in the provinces, he's often very, linked to very specific locations. Um, in Norwich in 1853, he was said to haunt the brick ground between the line of railway and uh, Southern Road. In Ashton in Manchester, the entrance to Parsons Yard by the side of the Boar's Head and Wicker Gate in Scott Street were two of his vantage points, very precise. Um, and these details kind of, as in fact they need good lie or fabrication, you need some sort of, some reliable details. These helped weave the fantastical into the mundane fabric of the city, which is a long established uh, technique used in street ballads, uh, particularly sort of catchpenny ballads which involve fictional accounts of ghosts in cities. People's reactions were also very different. Safe in the crowds, uh, in gaslit streets, rumours of Spring Hill Jack became some sort of uh, impromptu entertainment. You know, it's a, it's a, there's a, again traditions of urban ghost hunting, which was also a communal sport. Um, in Birmingham, it was said that many thousands of people assembled in High Street and the Bull Ring to see Spring Hill Jack leap from the roof of the market hall against the spire of St. Martin's <coughs> Church and for four and a half hours pursued this ubiquitous spectre all around the town. By contrast, the rural dwellers who are just trundling home on their own down a dark lane, he was still very much a source of genuine dread. Spring Hill Jack therefore sort of runs amok in large cities, small towns, rural villages alike. And is largely ignored by Victorian folklorists, as far as I've been able to, to find. Um, partly, I think, because they seem to think that urbanization was somehow anathema to superstitious beliefs. Yeah. They, they naturally looked out to the countryside, to sort of rural communities. Um, in London and in provinces, he wasn't some kind of quaint, remote tale, something that was back in the past. He was very much immediate, and in some cases, an immediate threat. Therefore, he didn't do what folklorists necessarily expected him to do, which is to provide an insight into sort of pre-industrial cultures that were supposedly going rapidly into decline as sort of Victorian England modernised and industrialised. Um, in fact, contrary to some sort of rural-urban flow, which would sort of suggest why he, you know, as rural migrants bringing this into London, which I don't particularly buy, given the speed at which this story uh, mm -hmm. developed and how fast he changed. Um, he's actually appropriated from metropolitan regions back into the provinces. And he's, they do this through associating them with local phantoms. In part, this, re this kind of results uh, or arose as a result of newspapers applying the label Spring Hill Jack to local ghosts, and sometimes a Spring Hill Jack, things like that, which suggest uh, a sort of a type rather than an individual. It also suggests that these encounters weren't necessarily spontaneously um, associated with Spring Hill Jack, but created sort of in hindsight. Um, you know, people had a, a spooky encounter in a country lane, and somebody later tells them that oh, it must have been Spring Hill Jack. Um, and it kind of builds from there. In, in Norfolk, uh, there's a black figure associated with lonely country lanes around the village of Little Melton near Norwich, and he's supposed, and this is before the name was applied, he was supposed to spring out of an oak tree uh, on unsuspected passers-by. And given that that kind of jumping motif in, in lanes is already present, the alloying of that local um, ghost with Spring Hill Jack became very easy. In 1850, he's associated with a ghost in Wakefield. Local inhabitants reported they had been alarmed by this half-man, half-monster walking the ground on moonlit nights. One man claimed he'd observed the goblin, as, they call, as he called him, trotting at unearthly speed over some uh, garden ground leaving a cloven hoof mark in the soil, a kind of old uh, link back to sort of the devil. In fact, they said they'd smelt brimstone in the trees. <laughs> so here, there particularly, it's 
If you have a very athletic ghost who is often linked to Springfield Jack, if he could move fast or jump around a lot, he was kind of likely to uh, acquire that title. If we move on to um, oral and literary interactions, I think part of this sort of move, this moving around, it's, it's sort of mercurial migratory element of this, is largely to do with a sort of symbiotic relationship between oral and literary cultures. It initially had burbled away as local gossip in South London. It had moved into print culture when the Times and other metropolitan uh, papers made the Lord Mayor's announcement uh, public. And he basically shuffled back and forth between oral and literary cultures until he faded out. Um, beyond half a dozen court testimonies of various people who were hoaxers or imitators or whatever, um, or people like Jane Alsop and uh, Lucy Scales, Spring Hill Jack generally operated in what has become the classic way in which later urban legends operate, the kind of friend of a friend mode. Mm -hmm. This is arguably close enough to sort of have credibility in, in the sort of looser communal relationships of growing cities, but detached enough not to require hard proof. And when journalists went looking for hard proof, they went looking for victims and people who said they had encountered him. Um, they met with frustration. The Morning Herald in January 1838 said, although the stories were in everybody's mouths, no person had actually seen the ghost could be found. Uh, when reporters located named victims, they immediately denied all knowledge of it but directed into other persons who they'd heard had been mis mistreated. But with them, they met with no better success. And then again, in following the Norwich encounter in the early 1850s, everyone had heard someone else say they'd seen Springfield Jack. This vibrant oral culture generated a host of theories about who or what Springfield Jack was. Um, the, the printed sort of form, certainly in the press, was that he was a prankster or a group of pranksters. Um, oral rumor went for things like he was a highwayman, he was an inventor uh, with a new flying machine. Um, there's also the rumor that he was an escaped kangaroo. So, you know, this, it was wide open as to what he could be. Um, provincial accounts added to this speculation. Um, when he appeared in Norwich, he, the press completely ignored it. But he was, he was recorded in a street ballad called The Pranks of uh, the Chatsworth Ghost. He claimed that for every night, uh, for a week, the streets have been thronged with hundreds of people keen to catch sight of him, catch a glimpse. Um, but adding to, sort of indicative of the mercurial uh, speculation that was going on, there, there was a verse in that states, some said he was black, some said he was white, some said he was short, some said he was tall, but most amongst them saw nothing at all. <laughs> uh, so pretty much sums it up. Um, and others added accruals to this, some had said they'd seen him rise out of the ground, others that he descended from the sky. So there was, again, this sort of strange supernatural element to him, it seems. And recounting this event in, the 18, in 1880, Mark Knight said that this uh, appearance of Springfield Jack in the 1850s had caused abundant opportunity for con uh, gossip of a conjectural nature, suggesting how the sort of modern legend provided a, a, an updating of imaginatively expressing supernatural sort of ideas and tropes in an urban environment. Certainly, we've, we've become very familiar with um, assuming that Victorian cities are defined by anonymity. You know, no one knew anyone. Uh, there were strong urban communities. They were, they were small, they were, late, they were associated with streets or perhaps districts, but they were strong enough to support oral cultures uh, in this period. And it's when the, when the newspa local newspapers weren't mentioning it, the fact that you've got hundreds or thousands of people sometimes forming up to chase this thing around the streets, suggests that didn't come from knowing about it in print form. It came from neighborhood gossip and rumor that really had power to generate this stuff still. Um, when he kind of, you, you get a, a, this period sort of cheaper printing technologies, the increasing in popular literacy rates, the emergence of a type of literature in terms of penny bloods and penny dreadfuls, which, um, Again, Spring Hill Jack is really going to sort of fit into that type of uh, genre, that type of, of literature, if you like. His attacks possessed all the um, required elements. It was sensational crime, there was a little bit of supernatural in there, there was damsels in distress, and there was challenges to authority. So it's all kind of very appealing. 
And the urban focus of his legend, uh, the Daily News picked up that the predominantly young readers of this literature knew no world outside the streets. So in the streets, instead of the forest, the adventure must be achieved. And so his kind of accounts of real attacks enhanced the sense of um, urban Gothic, which, you know, this kind of cheap literature both fed and fed upon. Print didn't necessarily fit Spring Hill Jack any, any more rigidly than uh, sort of oral gossip either. If you look at the illustrations from the Penny Dreadfuls, he's all over the place. Um, sometimes he's hairy like a werewolf, he's sometimes bat-like, vampiric, which I'll come back to in a little bit. Sometimes he's kind of this more di uh, diabolical figure. He's springing over there, he's got the kind of the, the pointy ears and the, the horns and, you know, there's, there's the sort of gauntlet thing. But it's kind of sort of a uh, sort of Mephistopheles type sort of look to him. Um, Spring Hill Jack, The Terror of London, which was a key serial that was published by the newsagent publishing company in 1867, just stuck everything together. Um, basically, he had this skin tight, glossy, crimson costume, which obviously isn't come out very well in black and white. Um, but he had horns, he had a lion like <coughs> mane, he had claws, bat wings, and cloven hooves. So he just, just lump it all together. He also had a reversible cloak where he could be kind of black and, and stalk around, but he could reverse it and it would be white to presumably give his enemies a sense that he was a ghost, because that was, again, sort of a, the image of a ghost in most people's minds was that they were somehow in white clothes. In uh, one incident in this, in this particular series, he confronts a bullying drunk, um, and his appearance is, again, quite startling. His head, body glowed with a uh, blue of phosphorescent fire, and from the back of which hung in graceful folds of lo a long striped cloak like a tiger skin. So th there's always kind of elaborations going on even there. Importantly, what this did also is reinvent him. In, eight, in the 1860s, late 60s, he gets reimagined re as a costumed vigilante. The, the, the baddies of 1838 is eclipsed by this image. And certainly in most penny serials after this, this becomes the kind of predominant image. He's a Victorian prototype of later superheroes. Um, there he is, he's, he's not harming her, he's, he's saved her. He's leaping out the window as the man, the nasty man shoots at them and he's, he's a dashing hero now. And the, the blurb on the back of this book uh, kind of pins it down exactly. It says, whereas a little over a quarter of a century ago, a person known to the police as Springfield Jack was frightened and caused the death of several persons, none of which have been confirmed, the daring deeds and startling adventures of this wonderful man will be published in weekly numbers. Uh, so it's, you know, we're supposed to like him now. Um, and again, th there were other sort of forms, there was plays about Springfield Jack that were also sort of disseminating this into the provinces too. They often started as metropolitan plays, very successful, and then they were ripped off by touring companies that took them into the provinces. And so promoted through press and fiction and plays, um, he found himself again incorporated into a lot of oral culture in the provinces. In the, back, in the black country in the mid-19th century, he was seen to have se uh, been seen on the roof of pubs and churches, associations informed by local clergymen who had sort of used him as a warning against drinking. And you don't go to the pub, if not, you're going to get sort of judged on by Springfield Jack. Um, and in a, a Petty Sessions uh, case in, in Vista in 1861, he was even used by a disgruntled employee who had set fire to his employer's hayrick and said, it wasn't me, it was Springfield Jack who did it. <laughs> that they didn't go for that one. Um, the, a play uh, comes out in 1868 sort of a, a by W. Travers, and it nicks the name of this uh, uh, Spring Hill Jack, The Terror of London. And so it comes out a year later. This has already been running. It kind of piggybacks on the success of this. So one cultural form encourages someone else to kind of try it and add to it. So at the same time, in 1868, you've got this serialized um, penny sort of novel running, and then you get the play. And the play claimed to be an extraordinary drama founded on facts, though it didn't really mention what. Um, and it, this kind of, both of these two things, the play and this book, both seem to encourage the revival that you get in the 1870s. Um, we've had sort of these you know, real sightings of older shots, and again, based on that, you have uh, another serial come out in 1878. So this kind of, it seems to go back and forth uh, oral and literary form of feeding one another. Um, <coughs> the important thing is, though, once Springer Jack undergoes his literary makeover and becomes a, a hero, 
That's how it pretty much stays in a lot of the literature, but oral accounts don't go with that. They stay with the traditional uh, accounts of a prankster, a malevolent force, person, whoever, attacking people. Um, which suggests, you know, that, that oral culture wasn't just the kind of nattering handmaiden of liter shifting literary portrayals. Um, they stimulated one another, oral and literary accounts, but they didn't duplicate interpretations of Spring or Jack. And this is really best seen in the whole thing of whether he was physical or a, or a spirit. Um, in, in obviously in 1838, they, he'd been physical, you know, they'd been cutting and scratching and, and general mauling going on. Um, in, in the books, he's also seen as a man who wears a mask. Um, but in a lot of the accounts that came later, he was, he was referred to as a ghost. Um, and th the best example is the Aldershot ghost. When he turns up um, at the army base, both the respectable newspapers like the Times and the sensational Illustrated Police News both carried accounts of frightened soldiers being sort of attacked or provoked or slapped even by Springfield Jack. Um, the Illustrated London News kind of uh, police news liked to add a little bit of detail, even if it wasn't real. And they um, said that his touch was as cold and as clammy as that of a corpse. Um, and again, when the soldiers fired, you know, it didn't, it didn't harm him. His, his kind of physicality was proved the following year, in December 1878, when he finally came unstuck, or a hoaxer came unstuck, because one of the sentries at the Colchester Army base, where he had also then gone off to uh, harass, stuck him in the leg with a bayonet. <laughs> and it kind of stopped him leaping a little while. And they found out, as the Times had suspected, it was an officer on the base, and it was a court martial. Uh, again, uh, another hoaxer was, was captured in the 1880s in Warwickshire. Um, there was a hunt for Spring Hill Jack following two attacks, and they found a local coal merchant's son who had dressed himself up in a ghost mask, a white sheet, and it fit his big springs to be issued. You know. um, the important thing with the kind of sustaining his legend into the, certainly into the 1880s was that the capture of these hoaxes at first didn't seem to impact on his legend. It wasn't, all right, we're going, that's it. Um, when they were captured, hoaxes were deemed to just be mere mortals who had dressed up and were cashing in on a real figure. And so in that way, Spring Hill Jack was always somewhere else, always somebody else, not the person you've actually managed to grab in front of you. Yeah. And, and so the legend could go on. I'm doing as well. So I'm going to get to um, the decline. And I, again, a, sort of a key cultural moment here, I say, is Wharton, 1888, Jack the Ripper. He eclipses Spring Hill Jack. I don't think he ever quite recovers from it, in a way, um, because Jack the Ripper came to sort of animate the popular imagination in a truly macabre way. Spring Hill Jack just leaps around and occasionally slaps people. Um, <laughs> Jack the Ripper, you know, this, that's kind of, sort of real nasty uh, butchery that's been taking place in the East End. Rumours of deaths by Springfield Jack are one thing, when you've actually got bodies sort of piling up uh, in Whitechapel, it's another. But importantly, part of the draining away comes from the fact that Jack the Ripper's legend steals quite a lot of Springfield Jack's clothes. Um, Judith Wagwitz has noted that his narrative was constructed, this is the Ripper narrative, was constructed piecemeal over a period of several weeks. And with no obvious clues, press commentary invoked the figure of a man monster who goes forth stealthily and takes his victims when and where he pleases. And such construction had been um, the nature of, of Springfield Jack's sort of formation in 1838. And amongst the many theories as to who the Ripper was, the idea of a mad aristocrat comes up again. Again, there's mm -hmm. sort of strong resonances there. Newspaper portrayals, um, this was from Punch, who's supposed to be the Ripper, or, you know, sort of this, again, diabolical sort of figure, very similar to uh, the Spring Hill Jack that we saw a little bit earlier, and also rather similar to this Spring Hill Jack. Oops, it's even got the ears back. <coughs> um, the most explicit link that I've found so far is Spring Hill Jack supposedly sent a letter saying he was the killer um, who was, who was uh, doing all the Whitechapel murders. The Ripper famously sent letters to the Vigilance Committees and, and the press, and promising more bloodshed, one person, whoever it was, signed it, Spring Hill Jack, the Whitechapel murderer. The, the big difference, perhaps, is that despite all the press hype, the Ripper didn't have that supernatural element that uh, Spring Hill Jack had. It still had currency in 1838, 
By 1888, the Ripper is very much a, a human monster and, and all the nastier and, and scarier for that. After that, uh, into the 1880s and into the 1890s, pretty much you get an increasing number of hoaxes being captured, which every time one's captured, sort of whittles away a little bit of that supernatural uh, sort of aura that had been around. Oh, that's a lovely sleep person, isn't it? You know, and this, this type of thing. In Clearing, um, Windsor, or near Windsor in 1885, a hoaxer had leapt onto a policeman's back, knocked him down in the street, and then run off, and they had policemen running up and down the streets looking for him. They arrested him, he was this athletic young man. Um, they stuck him in the cells for the night, but the worst he got was kind of going before the magistrate and getting stern telling off the next day, and then they released him, which shows that even hoaxers were sort of being treated as um, a nuisance. You know, they weren't the big threat that they had been in 1838. If that had been 1838, they'd have kept that person. But it's just kind of, you know, be, be off with you and don't be silly. In the 1890s, his name was still on people's lips, but he was more uh, often associated now with the damage the penny dreadfuls were supposed to be doing to people. It was the moral and mental sort of corruption um, so it wasn't him himself, it was kind of him as a fictional figure uh, linked to this literature. Um, I was going to just go to, there are some links with Dracula in um, 1899, The Wonder, a boys magazine, runs a series called The Human Bat, and it stars the story of a vampire known as Springfield Jack. So he becomes sort of a cultural cipher, he's taking on, you know, all these, he can be bent in any direction. Um, and it seems a, an attempt to cash in on this. And again, there's a sort of strong links, image, images between uh, the, the Dracula there and, and Springfield Jack. He also doesn't help make himself to become a comic character as well. Mm -hmm. He becomes a Batman who falls in, you know, he sort of becomes the butt of jokes. So there's that kind of credibility and, and fear is going. He's becoming a, a buffoon. Um, the last possible tangle between literary and real accounts is 1904, as I said. Again, uh, perhaps coincidence, perhaps not, it's the year in which there's a, a final publication, uh, Alfred Burridge's or Charles and Lee's, that's his kind of writing name, Springfield Jack gets published. And at the same, in the same year, you've had his appearance in Everton. He was seen bounding up and down William Henry Street during several nights. Um, the whole thing seems to be very confused. It all seems to be tied together nicely by um, giving him the name Springfield Jack. But, but the point is that uh, hoaxes and, and sort of elaboration are all starting to weaken him. In this particular account, he supposedly leapt across the, over a building, he leapt a, a tall building in a single bound type thing, whereas earlier on, uh, he'd only been able to manage sort of a, a hedge or something <laughs> like that. So there's a sort of an escalation into silliness. <coughs> um, just to very briefly mention the revival, and then I will be quiet. Um, like I say, he disappeared, but there are sort of, like every good movie monster, you know, he doesn't stay dead, he comes back. <laughs> the most faithful homage was perhaps in Provincetown in Cape Cod in Massachusetts in 1938. Yes, 100 years exactly to the, you know, after. Um, a tall figure known as the Black Flash, dressed in black, possessing eyes like balls of flame, um, capable of making huge leaps, and, and he even spat fire in the face of a teenager just to sort of drive the point home. 20th century theorists haven't really helped him much. I've mentioned Peter Haining. Um, Jay Viner, in um, a 1961 issue of the Flying Saucer Review, you can guess where that's going, says <laughs> that he was an extraterrestrial, and it was something to do with sort of gravity fields of weight and leap so high. Um, Mike Dash, as I've said recently, has kind of taken the legend to, uh, you know, cut it back down, got rid of a lot of the false accruals, but with it, perhaps almost too severe. Uh, he, he's stripped a lot of the supernatural element that people were talking about, not journalists, they were still very dismissive of that. But what journalists were reporting about what people were saying, he didn't seem to have given enough sort of credit to. And um, uh, of course, uh, Jacqueline has also flagged up you know, Spring Hill Jack on, on several occasions, particularly in a very popular Law of the Land. Um, I'd be quite interested, if ever one you could pick, why you picked Spring Hill Jack? That might, that might be a question for a moment. Um, literary, in literary terms, he popped up mm. Philip Pullman's novel. Again, here he is the 1860s remade version. It's the rebooted Spring Hill Jack. It's not the original one. This is the heroic one in a, a tale that sort of evokes and gently mocks the penny dreadful format. More interesting, I think, is this, which came out this year. This, this mm -hmm. will give you a light sort of steampunk and uh, altered world Victorian type thing. Mark Hodder's The Strange Affair of Spring Hill Jack 
um, show, you know, it's part of that vogue of, of steam, steampunk sort of writing that's been at the moment. Increasingly, Victorian London is no longer populated as deemed by Henry Mayhew's uh, sort of labouring poor and, and criminal underworld, but by a whole manner of monsters and magic, and that's sort of where that sub-genre is going. Um, and it's not surprising when writers start looking into 19th century, you know, Victorian England, they've, they've got pre-packaged monsters sitting there. He's a dream, you know, he's, he's got this sort of supernatural element to it. Um, he's a misunderstood hero. I mean, what more could you, could you ask for to put into a story? <laughs> Hodder's spin on this sort of sci-fi spin is that he's, I'm, I'm probably ruining this for you, um, he's a time traveler. He came from the future and hence the technical guard. So to very quickly conclude, Spring Hill Jack has always been characterised by his elusiveness. Um, there are the scattered incidents that we've got in the press, more rarely the courts, are no doubt only a fraction of all the amorphous tales that are swirling around his name in, um, in Victorian England. Spring Hill Jack in the provinces, uh, um, you know, there's many of them, many different ones that you see. There's conflicting or literary views of him as a hero, as a villain, as, as flesh or as, as a phantom. All of this makes it incredibly hard to pin him down. What it does show or suggest is this sort of strong interaction between um, cultures, popular cultures, between oral and literary cultures. Um, and and in, that tra in that kind of interaction, he's able to move from being an oral rumor <coughs> to urban press sensation, a literary and theatrical character, back to localized provincial folklore, and then eventually sort of generating to a, a bogeyman to be sort of told to kids. Never wholly belonged to any one of these, uh, his elusive movements between these gaps and overlaps help him evade historians and folklorists, possibly, um, as surely as he escaped 19th century policemen, I would say. And he basically leaps back up into the darkness of the past and leaves us still bewildered. <laughs> so many possible, you know, it, like I say, it's a, he's a very uh, mercurial character, and as soon as you start to go with one of those, it seems you start to have to cut loose a lot of what else is going on to, to fit into a particular line. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, perhaps it could be seen as sort of a, a cowardly way of not committing myself to one particular explanation, but I think as soon as you start doing that, then um, you lose a lot of the richness the kind of, uh, and the energy, in a way, as well, of this character by funneling it down sort of one functional interpretation of, of the many. I mean, all of them have, I think, and I, I, mean, I hope you have suggested, some merit. But, you know, if you've got, sort of th as you've just sort of pointed out, sort of three, you know, do you start putting them in a sort of a hierarchical order? If so, how, you know, this, those kind of issues start to come up immediately in terms of what factors do you weigh in the legends, um, and therefore which ones do you have to, to downplay? Um, and I'm, I suppose what I wanted to try and do is hold on to the, or suggest the totality of this as much as I mm. could. It, I, I think it's fairly usual for an image or a legend uh, or an idea to be multifunctional. Um, I've certainly come upon that in, in, in various other types of 
Uh, one of my first piece of research was about Changton Prairie, uh, and I thought it had just one story. And six months of saying to people, do you know any stories about Changton Prairie? Uh, and it wasn't one story, it was a dozen different ones, which some people told seriously and some people told as a joke and some people modernised and linked to UFOs, and some people were very archaic. And the one stable factor was the place. Well, in this case, I think you've got your one stable factor is the name. And uh, everybody must have been thinking of it. Right at the end, you mentioned bogeymen, the frightening yes. children. That was my first and only encounter with a living spring heel Jack tradition. Um, when I was collecting Sussex folklore 1970, one of my major informants was a Miss Lillian Candlin, then living in Brighton, but originally from Lewis, and I should calculate that probably her childhood would have been about 1915-1920, and when she was a child, uh, she and her brothers were told you be sure you go straight up to bed and you keep quiet and you go to sleep because Springfield Jack comes leaping down the street and he'll look in at the window and if you're playing the giddy goat he will see you and then you'll be sorry. <laughs> so the so last, last throw of Springfield Jack scaring kids and telling them to go to bed. It certainly goes on. The name is still around even after 1904. Oh, yes. Said, the know. name was still there. Yeah. Oh, yes. And talking of the name, um, I have a vague recollection that I looked up the term spring heeled jack in the Oxford English Dictionary and found it used as a common name for street hobbers. A yes. quote something along the lines of. Uh, there's so many of these here uh, spring eel jacks about, yeah. but I can't remember the date. But I think it's I, before the legend, isn't it? I haven't found any before the legend. Ah. I mean, I don't know if it's the legend's coming and then people are applying it. I found cases in 1840s and 50s where criminals are either taking on this name as a tricks or so. Mm. We, uh, we must have a look at the Oxford English Dictionary is a wonderful mm. resource. Mm. <laughs> I mean, all in terms of, um, I, I see it more as a kind of <laughs> cashing in. This Spring Hill Jack by, by the 1890s seemed to be up for sale almost anywhere. And it was this kind of, um, the, the depictions that I, I showed there uh, came after the Dracula. And, and certainly in the, in the comics, this idea of the human bat story and as, uh, Spring Hill Jack as a vampire. Um, it seems to be cashing in on the Dracula. So, um, I mean, I, I, I guess Dracula was popular straight away. It, it seems to be enough to actually impact on Springfield Jack. I don't know if it was a slow burn or whether it was a kind of a big sensational hit. Dracula was a slow burn at the 19th century, isn't there? And then a sort of explosion of um, vampire and black fiction in the 20th era in the mm. Southern Bell. Mm. Well, that's what um, Jane Hawthorne claims in her attack. The, the attack on her is being done by his claws or his fangs. So that's what you know, animals, Jack. Yeah. So yeah. Well, I again, I mean, it's something that I, I, I didn't put in because I had so much else and too Sorry. much. Um, but, uh, I mean, Christopher Frame's done some stuff on vampires and this idea of, sort of uh, um, the Polidori's vampire and that type of thing. I mean, even the aristocratic vampire was entering 
the popular imagination by the 1830s as to how much that was another trope that could have been thrown into the autopsy, if you like. You know, um, I, mean, I don't think, um, certainly Jackie, and you can uh, tell us this, sort of there's not a huge tradition of, sort of British vampires, is there? I mean, I've come across one infected, not personally, <laughs> but you know, <laughs> I think it's about 1830 something, but. Um, it all depends how you define them. Uh, if you insist that they've got to drink blood, otherwise they're not proper vampires, then no, there's no British tradition before Dracula. Mm. Uh, if you expand it a little bit to the undead corpse that gets out of the grave and goes about attacking people uh, by hitting them rather than by biting them or by breathing plague onto them, then you've got a nice little clutch in 12th century religious texts. Mm. Uh, after which they, they disappear. And if you go all archaeological and say, okay, uh, any corpse that is buried in a peculiar way with stones or tied up or something or with its head cut off, that's because people fear it might be an undead. Uh, but, but again, you're stretching the concept further and further. The undead, yeah, the true vampire, no, not before that. Well, uh, not before uh, Polidori. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, you've got the crossroad burial staking thing still, haven't you? But that's sort of coming in from well, the, the crossroad. The restless dead. Yeah. Yes, that's to prevent a suicide or a murderer or something coming back as an undead. Mm. Uh, but, but there's no suggestion he's going to suck blood. Uh, and the, there's been a, a confusion caused by an unfortunate phrase in one of the 12th century texts. Uh, it's in one of William of Newborough's accounts, where he says that they, they dug up the suspect corpse and they staked it, uh, and it, it was filled with uh, blood like a sanguisuga. But it's a comparison. And sanguisuga is the normal Latin word for a leech. And what he's saying is it was as full of it was filled with blood and it looked like a leech. But Montague Summers translates Sanguisuga as a bloodsucker and say and they and saw he was a bloodsucker. And that has kind of confused the issue. Uh, and if you're wondering why corpses uh, quite normally have blood in them, I can go into medical details. <laughs> Squish. Two trips north of the border to Edinburgh, and one in one or two in Wales. I think. You know, so he's, he moves around a lot, but he stays in England. So there's absolutely no post London reading. I'm sure you can find one. <laughs> Those things are kind of, they were coming from an English popular culture, or popular mm -hmm. cultures at that time. Um, and there is the thing of, yes, you know, uh, there's a very similar figure of his in Massachusetts. Um, and people, again, it's, uh, it's, it's 
14 times prior, although it sounds very dismissive, but um, they kind of, sort of stretch it to see how far they can go with it. And you end up with the monkey man or ape man in Delhi uh, about five years ago or something. You know, and by this time, obviously, he's bringing your jacket, but it's him, he's kind of nothing on for a good couple hundred years. Um, maybe possible, depending on what he is. But, um, you know, there is that kind of, I get the sense that once, it, it's very much fixed on the name, mm -hmm. and once that kind of gets diluted and you can go anywhere, and once acrobats start calling themselves Gringo Jackie, it starts to dilute. And once he leaves these shores, there's something about, yeah, there is that kind of indigenous, you know, Springo Jack is an Englishman of some sort, an English thing, um, that he, he's, not lo he's no longer the same person. He's kind of a jumping figure, but I'm not sure if you could just categorize him as something else in folklore or then. I didn't actually mention in here. I mean, it's in the Brighton Gazette. So yes, it was something like that. So that's, yeah, that's by April 1838. Yeah. So he wasn't around Shakespeare. He was, he was, I mean, I've come across, um, the, the thing is, you obviously, it, it, a lot of this is built, uh, you have to build it backwards. A lot of it is, is um, you find out about instances, not at the time, if you're lucky they're in the press, but if not, you have to kind of go to people's recollections and notes and queries and that type of thing. And it's often people reconstructing what they have forgotten. Um, and there has been mention of uh, a sighting in Chichester, but it sort of more or less just comes around to the 1840s. It's not that precise, um, which is frustrating. <laughs> It'd be nice to sort of, you know, mark all of this stuff down on a, a kind of chronological, uh, you know, you see his movements, but. Um, it is sometimes that vague, you know, they, they give you sort of a, I recall sometime in the 1850s, you know, well that's a big help, you know, <laughs> so, um, you know, but that's as good as it gets. Thank that's you. That's the sources you're working with. Thank you. One more question. Can I just have a couple? Mm -hmm. uh, you didn't actually um, uh, just mention Jekyll and Hyde. I don't think you actually mentioned Jekyll and Hyde in your talk. No. No. The one where it struck me, you were talking about goblins. one, um, which has got a due date in Jerry the first, I'm a bit cracking, um, <laughs> is about, it, it's called The Magical Imagination, and it's kind of, I didn't want to just look at magical practices in um, the urban environment in the, in the long 19th century, I wanted to kind of use that as an umbrella term so that I could look at um, both sort of su superstition, supernatural beliefs such as ghosts, magical practices, um, bringing in more modern sort of elements like mesmerism and hypnotism and clairvoyance and all those types of things. Um, but exploring the way in which um, magic and those kind of magical mentalities still had a place in the modernization of, of, of uh, basically people adjusting to urbanization and modernization through um, what we often uh, sort of see as old ideas. Um, so that's that one, um, and I suppose it's kind of an attempt to sort of place magic back in social history or something. Um, the second one is about Springfield Jack and popular cultures. So, uh, you know, this is, it, it's always interesting to get sort of questions and see how I can, all oh, right, I, I need to respond to that and I'm like, mm -hmm. um, yeah, this is kind of going to be a similar breakdown as to kind of how he's culturally constructed, um, the, the sort of what it reflects about popular culture and what it reflects about um, the way they kind of interact with trying to get to a sense of the operation of popular cultures rather than just identifying different popular cultures. Fantastic. I mean, we'll be getting both uh, a library of the time. That's a sale for a big part. I do hope you've got
back because I think what you're working on is really really interesting. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Translation or maybe rewriting of Carol's 